Hello, welcome everybody. Thanks for jumping on to join us this afternoon. We're gonna get started in just about a minute while we take a little time for attendees to log on and get set up. Again, welcome. We'll get started in just a moment or two. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hello, everybody. Thanks for jumping on. Again, we'll get started in just about a moment. Welcome. Uh, if you'd like to say hello while we're getting started here, please feel free to jump in the chat and, and say hi and let us know who you are and, and where you're zooming in from this afternoon. Again, welcome. And we're going to get started in just a moment or so. Please feel free to say hello and introduce yourself in the chat while we wait to get started. Hello, welcome everyone. We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. You are invited to go ahead and say hello and introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like. Let us know who you are and where you're zooming in from this afternoon. And again, we'll get started in about 30 seconds. All right, just a few moments after two o'clock Eastern. So we're gonna go ahead and get started here this afternoon. Hello and welcome again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Sarah Hackney and I'm the Coalition Director for the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition based in Washington, DC. As we get started this afternoon, if you'd like to say hello, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. Just let us know who you are and where you're zooming in from today. We're really glad you're here to join us um, for a little walkthrough of some COVID-19 aid resources for farmers, ranchers, and food businesses. Um, I'm really happy to welcome you here on behalf of INSAC, the Farmers Legal Action Group, and a cohort of additional partner organizations working really hard to help support farmers and food and ag organizations and businesses and workers amidst the pandemic. As this pandemic stretches on, while we may have passed through that early, very acute period of 2020, as you all know, we're still experiencing impacts in the food and farm sector and food and farm businesses and workers are still facing challenges and needs. Resources allocated through congressional bills earlier this year are still being rolled out to help address those needs, including in our sector. It can be at times a pretty confusing array of programs, opportunities, and acronyms. So periodically over the last year, we've been convening this webinar space just to host some learning and information sharing time for organizations and service providers and the folks who are doing that direct support work in the field with growers and other entities in the food and farm space. So again, this is really a space um, for us to share as much information as we can to try to be a welcoming, friendly set of faces to answer questions and to together identify missing pieces, gaps or needs that we can then in turn forward over to USDA or Congress for future action. My primary goal today is to share some key program updates on federal aid opportunities for farmers and for food businesses with a specific focus on CFAP2, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program 2, and a new soon to open program called the Pandemic Response and Safety Grants, both of which are coming out of USDA. Our focus today is to get you some good accurate information and to resource you uh, for the work you do directly interfacing with the folks who may be applying for this aid or these new resources. And again, our audience is primarily today organizations who work directly with growers. If we do have any farmers on the call today, you'll certainly find lots of helpful, helpful information as well. Just a note, 
If we don't cover a specific program or issue that you're curious about or that you have questions about, you'll still have an opportunity to ask those questions and we'll do our best to get you the resources. Um, even if it's not a program or an issue that we have deep knowledge on, we'll do our best to get you referred to where you can get help. Why now? What's the point? What's the focus this fall? Why is now a good time to do this? Two things. One, with CFAP2, the program closes in just about two weeks and there are many growers who still may not know about the program or may who have not yet had an opportunity to apply for this aid. So this is a collective opportunity for all of us to help folks get access to that support before the upcoming deadline. This is especially of need for diversified, smaller scale and black indigenous and farmers of color to have access to um, this important aid. Second reason that brand new PRS Pandemic Response and Safety Program is opening in just a few days from USDA. And we wanna help you get a jump start and be a little ahead of the curve for when questions arise so you're prepared to support your community. So that's what we have. Um, that's sort of what we're here for today and why we're gathering. I'm gonna take just a quick moment to name the organizations co-hosting today's call. I'll briefly walk through the agenda and then we're gonna be off and in motion. So today's panelists, you're gonna hear from staff from two organizations today, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition or INSAC and the Farmers Legal Action Group or FLAG. Um, I'll let each speaker introduce themselves uh, when it gets to their turn to do so and invite them to take a moment to say hello and introduce themselves when they jump in to speak and say hello. Um, since I'm the first speaker for INSAC, I'll take just a brief moment to introduce us. And again, I'll invite the FLAG folks to do that shortly. Uh, again, INSAC is a Washington DC based grassroots advocacy organization working to advance federal food and farm policy reform to build a more just sustainable food and farm system. We have a, we're a coalition of over 130 organizations working in all 50 states um, and we are based in Washington DC. And again, you'll get to hear from FLAG in just a few moments. I also wanna thank a couple of additional partners who have contributed um, time and energy and content towards some of the resources that we're going to share with you after the call today. And that includes the Intertribal Agriculture Council, RAFI USA, and Farm Aid. You're also going to hear about some resources from additional partners, including at the National Young Farmers Coalition and at OFA, or Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association. So more to come on resources and partners when we get a little further along. One quick reminder here, as is perhaps evident, but important to say up front, we are all nonprofit organizations. So the information that we're sharing today is our best interpretation of information that's coming out from federal agencies, including USDA. We are nonprofits, we're not the federal government, and it may mean that we can't answer all the questions, but we'll do our best. And again, if we can't answer it today, we also serve as a helpful convening point to identify questions and needs and get them in front of the agency for answers that you might need. So that's us and that's what we're here for. Just a very quick walkthrough on the agenda. We're gonna keep it pretty straightforward today. We're gonna to start with a little reminder of what is CFAB, who's eligible and what are some of the changes the agency has made on that program. We'll do the same um, for this brand new pandemic response and safety program. We'll name a few other additional relief programs and point you to where to find out information on them. We'll share with you some resource opportunities, including some places to send growers for direct one-to-one -one technical assistance. And for each section, there's gonna be lots of time for questions. So we're gonna break for Q&A at each section um, and we really welcome hearing from you on any of those questions. Um, again, for each program, this is what we'll cover. Some key deadlines, an overview, eligibility, key changes, how to apply, and again, plenty of time for questions. Now about those questions, we're on Zoom, uh, so I'll do a little Zoom housekeeping here and Q&A walkthrough. First and foremost, folks are uh, joining muted by default. That's for audio quality. Um, we do really want to hear your questions, however. So now's a good time to take a moment and notice that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you're gonna see a Q&A button. When you click that button, you can enter a question for the group and it'll show up for all of us. Um, I really encourage you, use it generously. We, what, we love to answer your questions. That's what we're here for today. Um, and you don't have to wait until the Q&A section to enter your question. You can go ahead and enter it in at any time. 
We will wait to answer them until we pause for that Q&A, but you can place it at any point in the box so you don't forget. Please know, drop it at any time. We're happy to get into it. Um, you're also, again, welcome to continue saying hello in the chat box if you haven't introduced yourself. We love to see who's here. But again, for questions, it's easy for us, it's easiest for us to manage them and not miss them if they are in the Q&A box. Final housekeeping item before I turn things over uh, to Stephen and Lindsay at FLAG. Just want to note and confirm this webinar is being recorded. So if you need to leave early, if you have a colleague you'd like to share it with, uh, you're certainly invited to do so. And we will share out that recording um, later this week, along with a set of additional follow-up materials. So just know it is being recorded and we're happy to share it after the fact. All right, panelists, any more housekeeping or welcome items before I hand it over to our friends at FLAG? All right. Well, I am really, really delighted to be doing this work as always with our partners at FLAG. We've been done a bunch of webinars together over the last year and they are some of my favorite people to work with. So let me hand it over to Stephen and Lindsay to say hello and dig in to CPAP2. Thank you much, Sarah. Uh, my name is Stephen Carpenter. Uh, I am, as Sarah, pointed, as Sarah mentioned, from Farmers Legal Action Group, FLAG, um, based in Minnesota. We're a nonprofit law firm that works on behalf of family farmers. I am here today with my colleague, Lindsay Keene. We're gonna kind of flip flop a little bit as we work our way through these, uh, through this discussion. So as, as you heard, we're talking today about the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program to the second iteration of this program. And I want to point out that in the, in the chat is a link to a very lengthy guide that Lindsay and I ju just wrote and we just finished up and published, uh, I won't say moments ago, but close, um, that can, that, that is a very, I'll say lengthy again, guide to, to CFAP2. And it's where you can find answers to questions and where you can also um, sort of look up and see how we decided uh, the answer to certain questions. Um, I also want to reiterate that we are happy to answer questions and put them in the Q&A and, and Lindsay and I or someone else will get to them all, I think, in the end. And as I understand it, you'll be able to get an email of that CFAP guide from FLAG um, uh, via an email after this is over. So all that said, um, in the the piece that Lindsay and I are doing, we wanted to really focus on four things. First, we want to talk about the deadline that's coming up for CFAP2. Second of all, we want to focus just a couple of points to people that are unfamiliar with CFAP2 or dubious about it and haven't applied or have people that just sort of assume it's not for them. So sort of a, a quick look at from the perspective, for the perspective of a person who's un basically unfamiliar. Then Lindsay's gonna talk about uh, some things that have occurred with the program for that really targets people who know much more about the program that have farmers who have applied, a lot of them have been paid, but we're down to the wire uh, and the rules have changed somewhat. And so there's some very particular things Lindsay, Lindsay can explain that USDA has done uh, more or less at the last minute. Um, the last thing that uh, we want to just quickly discuss is, as we know, everything doesn't always go perfectly with USDA, and so we're going to talk about appeals, discrimination complaints, and sort of what happens when things, what can happen that you can, might be able to do with things go wrong. So with that said, let's go right into the first point that we wanted to make. The deadline for CFAP2 is October 12th. And I think that everybody you know, in our little world dealing with folks in DC would agree that this is not a deadline that will be extended. We know USDA often extends deadlines. This is not one of those cases. Um, the CFAP was open uh, way back in October, or excuse me, in September of last year. It, it ran till December, then it reopened again in this um, April. And we have every reason to believe this is really it. So um, people who are procrastinating, fine, but now is the time. It's, it's about to be over. So if you're new to CFAP, just a couple of really basic points. 
Uh, this is real money. It's not a loan. It's not something you have to repay. These are actual payments to farmers. There is a broad system of eligibility. This is not like the, the Trump administration trade adjustment program, which seemed like they might have well just said it goes to corn and bean farmers and nobody else. Uh, this is broad eligibility in terms of crops and in terms of farmers. If you are involved in commercial farming, that is to say you're farming and you intend to sell that crop or sell those animals very broadly, you are very, very likely to be eligible. You do not need to have ever dealt with USDA before. Um, you're going to have a bit more paperwork to do. Um, one question that we often get is, well, am I going to have to get a farm number? And that weird answer to that question is actually only maybe. It sort of depends on what part of the program you would fit into. What I will say, though, is if you're somebody or your farmers that you're working with, there's people that really do not want to be in USDA's world at all, this program is not available to them. You do have to go in there. You have to sign up. You have to do their paperwork you know, conservation compliance, all this other stuff you're going to have to do. That said, uh, this can be the one and only time you deal with USDA. It's not a requirement that you have done anything else or that you do anything else again. So um, if you're commercial farming, as I say, very likely you're, you're a candidate to be eligible. The commodities are very broad. You know, it, the specialty crops are eligible. There are dozens and dozens of fruits and vegetables that are eligible, you know, for livestock of basically, I, I won't say, I wouldn't dare say all kinds, but pretty close. I mean, so they haven't tried to shave this down by limiting eligibility in some of the ways that we're familiar with. This is a very broad uh, effort. Um, you need to be farming for mostly, not 100%. Most people will need to be continuing to farm now when they apply. So if you, for most folks, if you gave up um, before now, that you're not going to be eligible unless you're a contract grower. So the, the last sort of super quick thing that I wanted to really emphasize is that when you look at this application, you know, none of them look fun to do, but it's actually pretty short and you're sort of filling these numbers and it's basically self-reporting. It's the farmer saying, I had this many head of cattle or I produced and sold this much produce. You're not required to produce any proof of that now. It's a self-reporting system, but, 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 USDA says you must have documents that in your possession that support your application. And they say they're gonna do spot checks. They say that they can come back to you later and say, we'd like to see proof of the sorts of things that you reported on your application. And the kind of things they're going to ask for is like, if you said you, uh, were, you, know, you had 25 head of cattle and 20 calves and a couple of bulls, they're going to want to see some paperwork that shows you had those animals. And that could be things like, you know, receipts for feed or fencing supplies or whatever. I mean, something that sort of shows that you actually did what you claim to do is something that USDA wants you to have. And we strongly recommend you do that because if they come checking on you and you don't, um, you will have a lot of problems. So that's the sort of quick and dirty aspect of, of CPAP2 if, for people that aren't super familiar with it. Let's now turn to a true expert, Lindsay, who's gonna talk about some of the details of the changes that have occurred of late, Lindsay. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Um, hello, everyone. It's nice to be here with you all this afternoon. As Stephen said, my name is Lindsay Keen. I also work at the Farmers Legal Action Group. And um, and actually, Sarah, would, could you pop back one slide for a second? Um, I know Stephen mentioned we're kind of speaking to two distinct groups. So those of you who work with farmers who don't, you know, maybe thought CFAP2 wasn't for them. And then those of you who work for farmers or with farmers um, who may have applied, but some of the rules have changed. And so um, I wanna talk briefly about both of those. And the only thing I just wanted to kind of point out on the slide that you're looking at and which Stephen mentioned briefly um, is really just to emphasize the um, broad array of commodities that are eligible. And Stephen touched on this, but there are really four main categories. Um, and these become important in when, in the way that USDA figures out the payments. 
for CFAP2. And I won't go into all of those details. They are in our guide if you're interested. They're in um, on the website for CFAP2. Um, but essentially the four categories, we have sales commodities, and those are most of your specialty crops. Um, and as well as a, a bunch of kind of miscellaneous is how USDA categorizes them. So goat milk, tobacco, wool, mink. Um, so just a huge variety of nursery crops, vegetables, aquaculture, things like that. And um, then there are what USDA calls price trigger crops and livestock. And these cover a lot of the typical row crops as well as your um, a lot of the common types of livestock. So your cattle, hogs, sheep, and then cow's milk and chicken eggs and broilers. The third category are flat rate crops. And those are sort of the other acreage based crops such as alfalfa, buckwheat, hemp, rye, and there's a variety of others. And then finally, and this is the one I just kind of want to emphasize because it is a newer addition. Um, Contract growers are eligible for CFAP2, and they became eligible in, I believe it was January of this year. And it was sort of interesting at that time because when USDA published a rule that said, okay, contract growers are eligible for CFAP2, they immediately put the payments on pause. And so it was a pretty confusing time. You know, they said they wanted to review the program. So for many months, although contract producers were eligible, there were no payments for them. But that has changed, and I will talk about that in just a minute. Um, so those are the, the big categories. And again, if you are working with a farmer and wondering if it's worth their time to apply, just keep in mind that um, as long as it's commercial production, most farmers um, would find that they are eligible. You know, whether it is worth their time to apply is another question. Um, okay, so with that, I will move on to the changes. And the, the main thing I want to point out is that these changes apply to everyone. So whether it's a farmer who's applying for CFAT2 for the first time, you know, in these last weeks, or let's say you're working with a farmer who already applied, um, but now the rules have changed and maybe they would be eligible for an increased payment. Um, so it's important to know that the changes I'm about to talk about apply to everyone and farmers can revise an existing or an already submitted application. They do need to go to F, um, their local FSA office to do that, but it is absolutely possible. So I wanna emphasize that. Okay, so I just highlighted kind of what seems like the main changes and there are more on our website and again on the CFAP2 website, um, it'll go into a lot more detail. But the first is there are a few um, kind of newly eligible commodities. And when I say newly eligible, some of these became eligible in January of this year with the 2021 Appropriations Act. And then actually there were quite a few changes made just at the end of last month. So in August of this year. So right now, some of the new commodities, pullets, turf grass sod and grass seed. And grass seed was just made eligible last month. Um, so those are, those are new commodities for CFAP. Um, perhaps the one of the more, I would say more important changes or most likely to affect a lot of the farmers you all are working with, um, USDA has changed the way that they calculate payments for sales commodities. So remember, this is that category of all the specialty crops and kind of specialty livestock. So it used to be that that was based on a farmer's 2019 sales of their raw commodities. Um, and if they didn't have 2019 sales, you know, the farmer uh, could certify to their actual 2020 production. But with a recent change, USDA is now saying that farmers can use their 2018 sales in place of 2019 sales. So if for whatever reason, you know, year 2018 was more reflective of a farmer's production or could lead to an increased payment, a farmer can substitute um, 2018 numbers. And along with this, um, USDA has said that included in sales, so included in that sales income, is any additional income that a farmer received from either the NAP program, a crop insurance indemnity, or a WIP plus payment. So for example, if the farmer wanted to use their 2018 sales, then they would look at the NAP or indemnities or WIP plus payments for 2018 and include that. And the same would be true for 2019. So that, that is a big one and it could, you know, it could lead to an increased payment for some farmers. So I would keep that in mind. Uh, and as I mentioned a minute ago, you know, contract growers are now eligible. USDA has come out with the rules both for how the payments are going to be calculated, but they also really expanded the type of contract producers who are eligible for the program. 
So previously it was just swine and poultry and poultry was defined, I would say fairly narrowly to um, include most types of chickens or chicken eggs, broilers. Um, but now, as you can see on this slide, there's a category of other poultry and that includes ducks, geese, pheasants, and quail. So if a farmer produces those under contract, they could be eligible. And it's also important to note that um, USDA has clarified that both breeding stock of any eligible um, swine or poultry or any of the eggs of any of the poultry are also eligible. So that is a big one, um, a big change that just happened at the end of August. Um, okay, the last one I wanted to point out, and this one I think changed back in January, but it could affect some of the farmers. So for those price trigger crops, it used to be that um, if a farmer did not have a 2020 APH approved yield, um, they would only get 85% of their 2019 ARCO benchmark yield. USDA changed that to 100% of that 2019 yield. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and I know I'm whizzing through this really quickly. I think mainly our goal today is just to kind of put in your mind these changes so that if you are talking to a farmer, if you know of someone who these might apply to, you can absolutely reach out to us with more questions or um, look on the website or look at the guide um, if you have questions. So this by no means covers everything in detail, but those are the big changes that have happened. And again, be sure to let people know that they can absolutely modify or revise an application if they already submitted it. The key is that has to be done by the program signup deadline of October 12th. So USDA is very clear that they will not take any application after October 12th, including any revision. So, okay, I... I whizzed through that, but I think those are the kind of top points that we wanted to make. And I'm gonna pass it back to Stephen to talk about appeals. So as, as uh, Sarah pointed out, we are not USDA. In fact, Lindsay and I are lawyers who uh, uh, fairly often find ourselves in disagreement with USDA's policies and interpretation of their rules. So uh, that said, um, it turns out that not everybody has an agreeable experience with USDA. Sometimes USDA violates its own rules. Um, and for that, there actually is an appeal system within USDA. It's called the National Appeals Division. There's a whole process to do that. And so if you feel like you, the USDA applied its rules incorrectly to you, you have the right to challenge those decisions. Um, and there's sort of a process, there's a fairly elaborate process to it. In our CFAP guide that we just published, we have, I guess it's five or six pages discussing roughly how the appeal system works. So um, the thing that I would emphasize is that you need to apply to get a denial because it's only with an actual denial that you can use the appeal system. If somebody verbally discourages you, uh, that's really bad and you can't appeal that. You really need to force them to uh, make a decision and you can appeal that even if you think that they're gonna deny you but you feel like you are eligible. So it's that's a, a very short description of the appeal system but it is there and I will say it, it's people win. I mean, it's not perfect by any means but it's a real system. Um, second thing I wanted to mention is that uh, for long time and in some quarters still, the assumption has been that all farmers are white men. Uh, we know better, of course, it's, that's never been the case and certainly is not now. Um, USDA has had a very difficult time administering its programs without discriminating against people and that's uh, widely known and um, I feel it seems that the current administration is is making a stronger, a more dedicated effort to uh, have that not be the case. But the reality is it has happened and it will continue to happen. There is at USDA a, a method where you can complain about discrimination and USDA has rules and an office that are designed to uh, investigate that complaint. And to be honest, that system hasn't worked very well in the past. Um, we are hopeful that with the, the current people that are running those programs, that there will be some change. So I, I wouldn't 
say that it's worth uh, you know ringing endorsement of uh, the discrimination complaint process, I will say that it's there. And um, if you feel like, feel like you've been discriminated against, it's something to inquire about and think through whether you might wanna to try to file a complaint. Also sort of uh, not widely known is USDA has a system, a little, a rule called equitable relief and it's kind of obscure. It applies now to CFAP. It didn't always, so far as we know. And basically what equitable relief says is if USDA official told you, oh, you don't have to file form X and Y, but it turned out you did, and you relied on that official, you may be able to escape the consequences of not having filed that form. Similarly, if you in really good faith F, try to do everything that you're told to do with these programs and you fail, and they're going to deny you, there's a chance that you can use a equitable relief to salvage the, your benefit. You know, again, I wouldn't get my hopes super high up, but it's there. And as long as it's there, and we have cases that sort of fits into what these things are for, let's use it. So with that, um, we, I, I guess we sh should we try to answer questions now, or are there we about sending questions? What do you what do you think there, or should we move on? We I'm have not. several minutes to answer questions, Stephen. So if now is a good time, I can. Um, it looks like we've answered a few uh, in the chat box, but if if you already, I can read out the additional questions that we have on CFAP two right now. Okay, so I see a question from Lori White. The question is, should farmers submitting an application get a receipt for service? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Um, again, I don't mean to be mean about USDA, but realities are realities. A lot of people have gone into those offices, left without any assistance, and there's no real record that they were ever there. And so USDA now has rules that say that you are entitled to a receipt for service when you go in that sort of records what it was that you did. It's really, really a good idea to get them. Um, the, Lori's question is when they submit an application, should they get a receipt? Actually, if they go in at all and ask questions about the program, submit an application, don't submit an application, they should always get a receipt for service. You know, it's no ironclad way to make sure that you get treated fairly, but from a lawyer's point of view, creating a record about your interaction with someone else is a very good idea if you fear it could turn contentious. So um, the short answer, yes, do the receipt for service. Awesome. What next? Uh, can farmers apply for CFAP2 even if their farms are not registered in FSA? My screen says, Lindsay, that you are typing an answer. Do you want to just say the answer? Oh, yes, I started on that. Um, so yes, you can. The thing to know is that there are certain forms that farmers will be required to fill out. And I was just about to include the link um, for the CFAP2 website, which lists them, as well as note that the flag guide has a whole section on the documentation that's required. Um, so things like a farm operating plan and other form, you know, forms to get your direct deposit payment. So you will have to interact with your FSA office and that's important to note. Um, but there are some requirements that won't apply for all commodity um, categories. And um, so like an acreage report is only required if you are submitting an application for an acreage based crop, such as a flat rate crop or a price trigger commodity. So, um, so there are some differences depending on the type of commodity, um, but you can absolutely still apply if you've never worked with FSA before. I would just say, you know, the sooner the better given that the, the deadline is coming up and just to make sure because it is a hard deadline that, um, that the farmer is able to get all of that in. And I am including this link right now, I'm hitting send. Okay, I'll go ahead and just read the next one I saw. Um, it was about the, the sales category of crops. And this is, the question is saying, you know, if you had a Schedule F that showed um, $10,000, but your CFAP2 application shows 15,000, you know, how could that happen? And Steve and I will say, jump in if you have anything else to add on this. But, you know, the interesting thing, so you are not required to submit 
your Schedule F. You are required, as Stephen mentioned, to have, you have to have documentation of the sales. And the way, again, the way the sales um, commodity category works is that it is looking for the sale of raw commodities. So for some farmers, you know, farmers who have value added products, like let's say cheese or, um, uh, that's the one that's coming to mind right now, you know, the farmer is gonna have to sort of figure out what the raw value of that commodity is. And there is no clear way of doing that. So I can see there being discrepancies between a Schedule F and what you put on your CFAP application if you are having to do, for example, some of your own calculations to figure out the value of your raw commodities. The other thing to keep in mind is that, again, for purposes of CFAP, they're including in, in your sales calculation NAP payments, WIP plus payments, or crop insurance indemnities. So I think the biggest thing to advise farmers of is as long as they have documentation to back up the number that they are putting on their application for that sales commodity category, um, it should be okay. And Stephen, do you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I mean, actually, I mean, one way to think about this is this question, this is really asking two different questions. So the one question is, how do you have documentation for CFAP purposes? And as Lindsay sa points out, you don't have to have necessarily 1099 stuff or other, you know, Schedule F or whatever else. Um, you just, for, for CFAP too, you just need to have documentations that show that whatever farming activity and effort to sell that you did, you, you, can, you can show with paperwork that you, this is roughly accurate. A completely separate question though, is your taxes. And you know, this is USDA and the IRS, the treasury department, this is all part of the federal government, but I would not assume that the right hand knows very well what the left hand is doing in the federal government as a general rule. So your, the question about what you report for your taxes is really mainly just a tax question. And, you know, people, you know, need to do their taxes as accurately as they can. Um, um, you know, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. You know, you, you, need to, you need to do your taxes accurately, but, and you also need to, if you're making a CFAP claim, have documentation in the background but, but those are two completely different processes and they don't necessarily overlap. I mean, you can use tax records for CFAP. Um, is it possible that the IRS could get CFAP records? Um, you know, not, I don't know. I mean, everything's possible, I guess. To my knowledge, there's no sort of routine sharing of those records back and forth. Um, there's no, you know, what, when USDA issues a 1099, that goes to the IRS. Um, but to my knowledge, there's no whole scale effort to track down tax fraud by looking at the intricacies of USDA's um, records. That said, you know, your lawyers are telling you don't mess around with your taxes, please. All right, flag folks, we could probably do one more live and then I would invite if you all are willing to answer the remainder in the Q&A box uh, while we shift to PRS, that would be great. But we can take one more if there's one more you feel like is, is good to do an audio or a speaking answer and then I'll thank you for answering the rest of them uh, in the chat box or in the Q&A box. Um, I'll just quickly do this anonymous question on legal resident status. Um, in our guide, and there's a link to that in the chat, we discuss exactly what the rules are for people that have um, some, some sort of non-citizen status. And if I'm reading this correct, so first of all, you don't, don't have to be a citizen. In fact, a lot of a lot of people in the program are not, I mean, presumably a lot, I mean, a fair number. There's the, the, the program explicitly is written so that you don't have to be a citizen, but there are some somewhat tricky rules regarding the contribution that a person must make if they are essentially a foreign actor. Um, and I won't go, I won't do more than that, but it's, it's in our guide. We actually made a, a strong effort to 
explain how that actually works um, early on in the guide. I hope that's helpful. You anything to add to that, Lindsay? I think. No, I think that summarizes it. Awesome. So we can work on the, the remainder uh, and mm -hmm. move, move right on. Thank you both, uh, Lindsay and Stephen. That was super helpful. And uh, thank you as well for continuing to answer questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we're going to now, I think so again, if you've got a question in the queue, we'll work to get those answered over the next little bit. Uh, so do know that we see them and we'll work on those for you. Uh, while we do that, I'm going to actually shift us over now to my colleague Wes King at INSTAC. We're going to shift from USDA FSA CFAB 2 to USDA AMS Ag Marketing Service and the new Pandemic Response and Safety Grants. All right, Wes, it's all yours. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a bunch, uh, Sarah, and thanks everybody uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, real quick, just you know, in these question and answer, something to 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 flag and maybe uh, uh, to flag, maybe flag can then respond to confirm for me. I see the question about African crops. I believe uh, uh, malokia is also known as Egyptian spinach, so I would think you could apply as spinach. And African corn is also just maize, so you would be able to apply as that, you know, with, with maize, I believe, but I, I don't know about Roselle. So uh, I'll let maybe the, the chat box function or the Q&A uh, discuss that further as to whether or not uh, uh, Flag thinks that, that, that it would fit. Um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and start talking about the Pandemic uh, Response and Safety Grants program that is uh, uh, recently been uh, uh, announced. So you may have heard a little bit about it, but this may also be the first you're hearing about it. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. Great. So, you know, the first thing to, 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 to say up front about the program or to share is what, what some of the deadlines and timelines uh, related to the application period are looking at, looking like. As of right now, we do not actually know the official date into as to when USDA will start accepting uh, applications for the uh, Pandemic Response and Safety Grant Program, but they have announced that it will be early October at some point, um, the actual date to be announced later. Um, linked in the actual uh, slide there, and we can uh, uh, um, share it in the chat function as well, is a link to the where the application portal will actually be. You can go to that now, and we'll talk a little bit about that more in a, in a minute. Um, so once the application opens at some point in early October, uh, 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 people will have a 45 day application period to uh, apply to the program. So a, a fairly short time turnaround. In order to apply, you're also going to have to have a DUNS number. Um, a DUNS number is, is, you know, it's this one of these, these numbers that the USDA requires you to apply to get in order to apply for grants. The good thing is that it's free. The other good thing about it is they, the USDA has also created with the, the, the third party that uh, uh, administers this DUNS program uh, 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 system, created a separate portal relative to this brand new grant program for folks to apply for a DUNS uh, number. Um, they did that in part uh, because they are expecting to get at some point, once this opens up, somewhere between 200, 200 300,000 and 350,000 applications. And, you know, if all those people in the next couple of days or at some point in the next month tried to get a DUNS number through the normal uh, channel, uh, they may crash the system and it, it could create problems. I'm also putting the link in the, oh, I sent it to the wrong place link to the uh, um, DUNS number portal, the special portal that USDA has created as part of this program to apply. It only takes about five minutes to apply, um, but it can take up to five business days to get the DUNS number. So that's why it's really, uh, uh, really highly recommended that if you or any uh, people you are providing technical assistance to are interested in planning to apply for this program, that that is the very first thing you do. Go get your DUNS number. Uh, um, 
we'd hate to have people applying last minute, not have a DUNS number, and not being able to actually get assistance through the program because of this five business day wait period that can sometimes occur in order to get the actual number once you've applied for it. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, you got it. There it goes. Sorry, it was a uh, delayed on my end. All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about what this program is, because uh, um, I'm sure you're, you know, people are wondering, okay, well, I get it. The deadlines are here. They're there. But what does this actual grant program do and who is it for? So what the produce or the pandemic response safety grant program is designed for is to provide small grants to food processors, distributors, farmers markets, food hubs, and actual ag producers uh, uh, um, assistance for responding to the coronavirus, including uh, uh, you know, for measures to protect workers. Um, AMS has set aside $650 million for this program. Um, and, and the way it's set up is that you will be able to apply for, for to get funds to uh, uh, more or less uh, help reimburse costs that were incurred between January 27th of 2020 and December 31st of 2021, costs related to responding to the coronavirus and, and, and measures to protect workers against the coronavirus. Um, it, on the website uh, at that portal and some of the other documentations that uh, um, have been uh, provided by USDA, they, they spell out a number of different uh, kind of broad categories in which uh, um, are eligible to request assistance or, or reimbursement for, to some extent, for costs incurred. Uh, and those, those, those broad topic areas are workplace safety, market pivots, transportation, retrofitting facilities, worker housing, and worker health, uh, uh, health services. Funding requests for these various categories by food processors, distributors, farmers markets, any eligible entity, can range from $1,500 to $20,000, which is, you know, small grants, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, th this $20,000 can be a, a, a really a boon to an operation that's been uh, 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 spending a lot of funding over the last year or year or more in trying to uh, keep their workers safe and keep their customers safe. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about, so what does workplace safety, market pivots, transportation, retrofitting, et cetera, et cetera, what does that work or what does that mean? And what are some potential uh, examples or, or, or ways to start thinking about this so that you can, uh, uh, if you are a producer yourself or a processor, a food hub or, or a farmer's market, you can think, hey, start thinking through what, what would we be uh, eligible to apply for? So when it comes to workplace safety measures, we're talking about uh, uh, things like purchasing personal protective equipment for uh, workers at your plant, your food hub, your farmer's market, your farm, thermometers uh, uh, for, for, for related, related uh, uh, monitoring, cleaning supplies, sanitizer, hand washing stations, you know, all these type of things uh, uh, that are essential to protecting workers, regardless if it's a farm stand, a food hub, a farmer's market, or, or, or some sort of other uh, eligible business. They've also made pit market pivots um, as something that is eligible to seek assistance for or funding from. And you may say, well, what is you know, market pivots? It can be kind, kind of broad, but think of market pivots as things like uh, a, a farm that used to do a, a CSA pickup in person, implementing some sort of online ordering system or a farmer's market implementing an online ordering system. Or let's say a farmer's market sets up as part of an online ordering system, a drive-through pickup at the farmer's market. Or let's say the farmer's market has redesigned the layout of their, of their actual market to keep people at safe distances and to keep uh, consumers as well as uh, the vendors safe. All of those type of market pivots are also eligible for funding. And then last one I'll, I'll talk a little bit about there is retrofitting facilities. Uh, so things like installing protective barriers, heat lamps, fans, tents, things that uh, uh, making changes to facilities in order to make them uh, 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 usable 
within uh, uh, the situation that we find ourselves with the coronavirus. Uh, you know, one of the things too to, that I think is important to mention as with, with all of these eligible uses of the funding is staff time is also uh, uh, something that uh, can be uh, uh, funded through these. So if, you know, there was staff time at your farmer's market involved in setting up a drive through or extra security was added in order to make sure people are masked and staying distant, staying away, you know, uh, socially distanced, as well as, you know, you know, similar things like that. So staff time, if it can be directly connected to um, these other uh, uh, eligible uses of funding it is eligible. A and good point to, good place to point out uh, something similar to, to what Stephen talked about with CFAP, this is the way they're doing this is more or less self-reporting. They will not be asking for detailed documentation um, at, uh, uh, they will not be asking for detailed documentation at the time of application. However, they will be doing spot checks and auditing the program. So if you are applying, you wanna make sure that you have documentation of some kind to uh, uh, be able to justify uh, uh, the, the costs that you, or the funds that you have requested. And, and I think the USDA is going to be taking a pretty broad view of what that documentation looks like, but you do need to have documentation. All right, uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about program eligibility. Um, so, you know, just as important as what actual uses of the funding uh, uh, you, can, you can apply for, who is eligible? So eligibility is entities that meet the Small Business Administration, small business size standards, uh, um, and, and as well as nonprofit organizations. So these, these small business size standards are, are actually vary quite, uh, uh, quite a lot depending on what type of uh, organization or entity you are in terms of the supply chain. Um, so one of the things that's really uh, uh, important to be doing is going to that portal, the uh, uh, AMS portal that I mentioned earlier, uh, um, where you can begin to start looking at um, the eligibility requirements. It's one of the really nice things about the way USDA has done this is, is they've set up the program so that you can begin to look at your eligibility and begin to get things ready to apply before the application has actually opened up. Uh, um, so drilling down a little bit more uh, uh, deeper, you know, the small businesses in terms of eligibility, that includes diversified uh, uh, and small scale diversified and specialty crop producers, produce distribution companies, food hubs, meat processors and distributors and farmers markets. Um, also important to note that for this program, all farmers markets are considered small. You will not find some sort of size standard in terms of SBA to determine whether or not your farmers market is small. They are uh, 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 deeming all farmers markets as small businesses. All right, next, uh, next slide. Um, so just to kind of summarize some of these things, uh, um, the application, window has not opened yet, but it's expected to open early October. Um, that's something that's going to be officially announced at some point in the near future, hopefully. Um, and it, again, it will have a 45-day application window. Again, get your DUNS number now. Really stress this. Um, it's really important to make sure uh, 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 folks get this information and are applying to get that, that DUNS number now so that you don't end up in that situation, like I said before, where you're trying to apply at the last minute, but it's a five day wait to get your DUNS number. And oh no, that puts you just outside of the 45 day application window. And lastly, again, I, I mentioned this before, the PRS application portal is already open, though you can't submit applications, you can begin to check your eligibility and you can begin to start looking through a little more of the details that AMS has put together about what is uh, uh, eligible for funding requests and what is not. Um, with that being said, we can do questions now. All right, and we have definitely started to get a few PRS questions in. So 
first question up I have, or actually first is just a, a note from Jeff. He says at NCAT, they've heard tentatively, we expect that it could open on October 12th. Um, in terms of a potential opening day for the application window. I don't know if we can corroborate that, but that seems like a reasonable guess. I, I cannot corroborate that. AMS has not told me that. Cool. Uh, um, two, the, the, I see uh, uh, also another kind of uh, note from Jeff. Um, good, good, good note, Jeff. This is not, um, this is not being viewed as a competitive grant. Uh, um, they are actually using the, 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 the back end infrastructure that they use for competitive grants program, but it's not be, being treated at, as a competitive grant program. It's not set up on a first come first serve basis. Uh, um, they, in, they anticipate uh, um, providing assistance to everybody who applies and is eligible. However, they have said if they get huge response well beyond the 650 million um, that they've allocated for this program, they may have to prorate awards. So you may not get the full amount um, that you requested funding for, uh, but you should get something. Awesome, great. Um, next question, um, and I'll just kind of work through these for you. On PRS, will this cover expenses that were covered by other grant programs? And they say, I'd assume no, but just double checking. This cover expenses that so so can you that were so for example if you received some other grant support to cover the same expense can you know, essentially can can this funding help support something you may have gotten support for from elsewhere as well? Uh, yes, I th I think the assumption of no is correct. Uh, um, this is actually something that that's come up uh, in some of the discussions we've had uh, um, with the with AMS around meat processing because there is other assistance going to uh, uh, meat processors and meat processing infrastructures. So yeah, there is no double dipping. Right. And then we have a, please explain market pivots as best you can. How could a producer calculate such a thing? Well, I, I think, think about it, I guess, in the way I would think about it in terms of calculation, let's say you're a producer and um, you decided to, you didn't have an online ordering system you now have an online ordering system. There is an assumption, to me at least, that there is some sort of cost involved in, in getting access to that online uh, uh, system. So that would be one of the costs. Um, but let's say like on some of these other market pivots that I came up with, like a farmer's market creating a drive-through um, pickup option, there's going to definitely be uh, um, costs involved in that, you know, it, well, maybe costs involved in the actual setting it up. Um, it, it's possible that the farmer's market already had the various cones and various kind of little pieces of infrastructure to create that drive-through sit situation. But then there's also staff time that's going to be involved in, in setting that up and running that drive-through. And, and that's the type of thing that I think uh, uh, it, it's going to be uh, they're going to be looking at, I guess, it, I want to say people should be creative with their documentation, but not uh, 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 untruthful. Let's say, you know, it, when one of the conversations we had with AMS about some of this, they, they mentioned like, well, let's say, for instance, if the boss sent an email to the staff that, hey, today I need you to spend this amount of hours on setting up this, and you're going to then be manning this a uh, uh, drive-through for this amount of hours, that, that hourly rate that that person spent on that can be uh, uh, also part of, of the request for funding. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully that tries to answer. Okay. Definitely, I think uh, uh, one of those things that I, I think as this program evolves and hopefully more uh, once the portal opens up, AMS puts out more Q and A's because I, I, they are actively looking for these kind of questions so that they can yeah. be ready with answers when the portal opens up. Uh, um, so it, it may be that I will uh, 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 flag for them that there may be additional needs to document or not document, explain what market pivots are. Yeah, I think also Wes on the, the question just a moment ago about double dipping, um, we have just a response from Roland that says, 
Uh, one state department of ag is encouraging folks who may have gotten money from a state level uh, PRS like program last year to also apply for the new AMS program. So it sounds like maybe there is a little bit of different messaging happening there and that might be another thing we could flag for AMS that they should be they need to be extra clear about that uh, in their materials because there's not much on the website right now making that clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Roland, it, it would be useful if you could Oh, did I misunderstand you? <laughs> All right. Well, if you want to clarify that, I may have misunderstood. Oh, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Noted in the chat. <laughs> what what I may be worthwhile to flag relative to that uh, is that so here's what it, uh, I'm going to read uh, something uh, pretty much verbatim uh, from AMS that's really important for this. I think. Um, applicants are required to attest that they have not used other federal funds used to cover the cost of the activity or activities selected in their application. As a note, some state funds may actually be federal sources, including CARES Act, specialty crop block grant program, etc. So folks need to be need to maintain an awareness there. So it does sound like they are saying that if you got funds through a state program, that it you have to be careful because many of those state funds may have come, may actually be federal funds and you will be uh, in applying have to attest that you have not already received federal funds for these activities. Great. Thanks, Wes. Um, got a couple more questions here. Um, we'll do one more on market pivots, which is under the market pivots category. This is from Lisa. Uh, would additional packaging and labeling costs, i.e. if a farmer shifted to a CSA, be allowable? And wondering if retrofitting an existing on-farm space for cold storage would be allowable if that cooling space allowed the farmer to shift their market channels? My interpretation is yes to both. Uh, uh, yes to packaging and labels as part of uh, uh, the, the farmer shifting as well as the retrofitting uh, a cooling space uh, as part of that shift. Great, and so same for packaging and labeling costs, we expect that that sort of thing would be eligible to the best of our understanding. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident just based on conversations I've had with AMS uh, of the lead up to the creation of this program and what's currently available on there uh, website and documentation that both of those seem very, uh, very seem like good fits. Great. Thanks. And like with all of these, we'll need to verify when all the full details are out, but it's certainly helpful to have that sense. We're pretty sure that's on point. Um, another PRS question, um, would not-for-profits 501c3s be eligible to apply? Yes. Uh, and beyond 501c3s. This was actually one of the uh, uh, originally, the, the, the portal and application materials said only 501c3s. Uh, 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 we actually uh, uh, eliminated something like half of all farmers markets in the country because most farmers markets that are nonprofits are not, are, or half of them are not um, classified as 501c3s. The IRS will actually, it, it is increasingly unwilling to give that nonprofit IRS designation to farmers markets because they generally do not have, don't meet the kind of educational requirements um, that, that are associated with a 501c3. Um, but uh, AMS has said uh, in conversation that updated materials uh, for the program will make clear that um, uh, 501c3s and beyond, uh, basically they're going to say, uh, uh, any nonprofit that has the IRS uh, uh, nonprofit status is eligible. Great, they'll just still need to meet the other eligibility criteria, right, in terms of uh, what they do. Yes. So are you a nonprofit that is also a food distributor? You're eligible. Okay, um, next question, um, or is maybe a recommendation for someone that will need to be clear from AMS, we'll wanna make sure there's some clarity around any conflict with PPP loan reimbursements and PRS funding? I don't know if we have any guidance on that yet or if that's another thing we could maybe flag for the agency to be clear about. 
Yeah, I, I that has not come up uh, uh, yet. So uh, that is definitely uh, um, a good flag and something we will we'll bring to them. Great, thank you. Um, another question. Um, does INSAC anticipate AMS funding any new RFPs for outreach partnerships on PRS? What? AKA, are we gonna are they gonna skip out any outreach cooperative agreements uh, to help support PRS? I the answer I, is no, right? Yeah, they have not that they have. Uh, well, so the no. Well, I don't believe they. I believe they have already. Uh, uh, been in the process of entering into some cooperative agreements with a number of different uh, uh, organizations across the country to do uh, uh, assistance related to uh, the program to help outreach and uh, uh, help people with applying. Um, but I think that was not, I don't, they did not do that through any sort of, uh, you know, public request for proposals that I am aware of. But I do believe I am almost certain that they have signed some agreements with a number of uh, uh, national organizations to help with this. Great. Don't, don't Thanks, take my word as the, as the gospel on that one. I don't know that for sure. Cool, great, thank you. Um, and then could processing fees for livestock be covered if animals that were meant to be sold at auction were processed instead? Hmm. That's a good one. Um, that's a good question. I do not, I do not know. Um, and I don't feel comfortable taking a, a stab at answering that off the top of my head. Uh, but that is definitely a good question to add to the list of things to uh, um, check in with AMS about. Great. All right. So if there's anybody else who's been needing to ask the question, you can go ahead and place it in the Q&A box now. Um, we'll give folks just another few seconds to ask them if they have them. Good questions. Um, Wes, do you want to just speak briefly to um, if we if we were to collate a few of these, do you think we'd be able to get them in front of AMS in the next few days to next week and then share back to people? Yeah, yeah. If we get them collated, I, as soon as they're collated, I can get get them to the right folks at AMS, and they've generally been uh, a pretty responsive to these kind of questions. Um, it, it you know, twenty four hours max is what it's been taking to get responses. So we should be able to get some answers sooner than later. Great. And just so folks know, um, by registering for this webinar, we can follow up with you when we have some answers and share them back out with all registrants. And I, I do expect there will be more questions to come, um, but it is really heartening that the agency has been quite responsive in trying to work with stakeholders to understand where there are needs and where they need to make additional clarity. Great. So that is all the questions that we have on PRS and CFAB. Um, anything else on PRS, Wes, or anyone else before I shift back to the flag team for just a, a, a sort of a preview of a resource we have coming your way? One of the things that we have worked on is we used to call it a three pager, but I guess it's now like a five pager or a six pager, which is a really short summary of a chart of all COVID relief assistance. And we're just now updating it uh, along with the help of INSAC and others. And that should be out and on our website uh, directly. Um, it's, it's what it's really good for is just like because it's sort of a blizzard of programs like, okay, what is this? What does it do? Um, and what are the deadlines is, is what we try to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thanks, Stephen. And again, you should expect to have that in your inbox uh, pretty shortly as a webinar registrant. It, the document is ready to go. It simply needs a nice PDF cleanup and it'll head your way. And again, if you've been wondering about the status of other programs, that's a good quick reference for you and for farmers you're working with. Um, we can also take a moment here if there are other programs that folks have had some questions about or want to ask about, no guarantees we can answer it, but we're at least happy to hear the question and see if we can help. 
So if you have any other questions about additional aid programs, now is a fine time to ask them before I hand it over to Eric for a few moments. So I'll just take a moment here. There's other programs that you have questions about, now's a fine time to ask. All right. Well, if you think of something, you can place it in the chat box and we're happy to tackle it. So we'll shift gears for a minute here. And we've been really in the weeds here on a program that is open and a program that is soon to open. And again, with that six page short resource, if you've been thinking, whatever happened to EIDL? <laughs> Do I, if, we, if someone needs bankruptcy support, where can they go? That six page resource that Stephen just mentioned is a good quick reference for that if you want the links and the names all in one place. Um, but also looking forward, Congress is still working on additional COVID-19 focused legislation. Uh, there's pieces folded in to some of the work that's moving through Congress right now in addition to its climate focus. It's a confusing landscape in DC. And so I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Eric Edensack, to just share for a few minutes about what we're seeing from Washington and give you a preview of some things that could be coming down the line in the next few months, just to give you a sense for what you might expect coming next. And I'll hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Eric Diebel, Policy Director with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And it's always a pleasure to talk with such a, a robust audience uh, and great speakers. Uh, I think Stephen said it perfectly when he said that there's been a, biz a blizzard of programs. Uh, and that's true. And I think we're in for some more blizzards. Um, if you are struggling to keep track of all the different things going on in DC as it relates to food and farm policy, just know that we are too, um, but we are doing all that we can to stay on top of it to help keep everyone informed. There's a lot that we don't know, but a few things that we do and a couple more that we expect. And I'm just gonna walk through them real quickly. One thing that we know probably isn't gonna happen is we don't expect a CFAP three. It seems the administration has pivoted away from a general blanket coronavirus response program to a series of individual responses meant to identify and address specific problems that resulted as the pandemic moved through the food system. And so many of the things that we're talking about, including the PRS program, are a, a more targeted or an effort to be more targeted in the way in which USDA supports producers or market participants that have suffered as a result of, of the pandemic. So we don't think we're going to see a CFAP3. But we do know a couple of more programs that will be coming out that will be supporting folks uh, in addition to CFAP2, which is wrapping up, and PRS, which Wes ably described. Uh, we know there's about $700 million uh, at AMS right now that AMS is intending to use to support supply chains. Uh, for long-term structural investments uh, to help mitigate some of the impacts of the pandemic and to help prevent them in the future. Uh, and many of you have been involved or maybe have heard about these uh, conversations that USDA has been having. This is about making the supply chain more resilient. Uh, and in the current context has been mostly about improving access to small scale slaughter for small and mid-sized producers. So we know there's about $700 million that will be coming out in the form of grants shortly. We also know, as of as late as yesterday, uh, that there's about $500 million uh, in short and midterm supply chain related money uh, that will be coming out of USDA. And that is part of the $3 billion that USDA has now obligated from the CCC Right, the Commodity Credit Corporation, that they'll be using to uh, help uh, meet the expenses incurred by folks that have been working to get food on everyone's table. We don't know exactly who's going to be eligible for that. We don't know exactly what the scope is, but it may look a little bit like PRS, uh, but being targeted more towards processors than it is towards um, farmers or markets. So those are a couple of things that we do know. Um, 
But there's a lot going on right now that folks are talking about that we don't have 100% certainty on. And I'm just going to talk about them real briefly so that you know that we're aware of them and we can keep you plugged in. We've got a budget reconciliation happening right now, which is that big $3.5 trillion package that slowly may be making its way through Congress. Uh, in part of that package, there is nutrition conservation, research, and debt relief provisions, all of which could affect farmers. And many of these uh, are were created in response to the coronavirus pandemic, even though many of the investments that would be made go far beyond them. Um, also, there's an infrastructure bill that's hanging out there right now, right next to that budget reconciliation uh, bill, and it contains components of rural development, energy, broadband, uh, and, and those are other significant investments that could be made into communities that are still reeling from the pandemic. And as of about, uh, I think, maybe 10 minutes ago, uh, we've learned that we have an agreement on a continuing resolution, which will keep our government funded through December 3rd. But there is still the annual appropriations process and a lot more money that may be coming out for ag programs, again, that may address certain elements of the coronavirus pandemic. And finally, we also learned in Secretary Vilsack's announcement yesterday that there is the intention to spend many billions of dollars from CCC funds next year to support climate smart commodities. And that announcement was made yesterday. Some of the things in that announcement include access to markets. That's not carbon markets, that's getting your product into a market. And if that market was disrupted, that supply chain was affected by coronavirus, there may be support available to you through that spending. That right now is going to be an RFI, Request for Information, rather than a NOFA, a Notice of Funding Availability. The RFI comes first, the NOFA comes second. So you're going to have the opportunity to weigh in about how you think that money should be spent, how those programs should be structured. If any additional program comes to fruition, or looks like it's going to, we'll be on it. Um, we're going to do our best to make sure that you all understand how the programs work, um, we're going to show you where you can comment uh, if there is the opportunity to do so, uh, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do some additional future webinars um, as these programs come to fruition to help everybody uh, in our space understand how we can get farmers the support that they need. All right, there is a lot to what I just said in just a couple of minutes. You may have many questions. I probably have few answers, but I welcome them in the Q&A, uh, and I'll go ahead and hand it back to Sarah. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that kind of 30,000 foot landscape view. Uh, if you have any questions on the landscape or what we're seeing coming down the line, we'd welcome them. Uh, we're, we're tracking it as best we can, and we'll do our best as well to, to get that information out to you as we have it, including program information and including the RFIs as they open. It is um, not the most straightforward process to navigate it all, so we're happy to do whatever we can to help you. Um, question, actually, Eric, this is a good question. Question from Shakira at Young Farmers. Will there be any programs for debt relief for BIPOC farmers as part of some of these packages moving forward? Yes, and it varies amongst all of the different programs that I mentioned. Uh, there are some specific provisions within debt relief. There are specific provisions within conservation under the budget reconciliation that are targeted, oh, and conservation programs that are targeted specifically towards supporting BIPOC producers. Less so in the infrastructure, but a close reading of that may reveal a couple of elements that are helpful not for BIPOC producers, but for BIPOC serving markets and communities that are predominantly BIPOC in the way in which those funds are allocated. There is a big question mark on how the $3 billion um, that were announced yesterday may affect uh, $3 billion in USDA expenditures coming out of the CCC may be targeted directly towards BIPOC farmers. We anticipate that there will likely be some provisions around that $500 million that will help target funding towards those uh, producers. Um, it is far less certain about how um, the additional money for the climate smart commodities may be targeted towards BIPOC producers. And as Stephen has said, uh, and I think it's I think it's fair to uh, consent here, um, USDA has a pretty poor track record when it comes to meeting the needs of BIPOC producers and BIPOC communities. Um, it seems that they are trying in earnest to do so, 
uh, particularly as they're standing up these new programs. So my suggestion is um, that you keep, you, you know, we will do all that we can to report out uh, and influence those programs to make sure that they do um, serve everyone uh, in an equitable manner. Uh, but also, if you have strong feelings or thoughts about how these programs could be improved, make a comment. USDA is listening very closely in the comment process, uh, and there is a real opportunity to define how you think the program spending should be done uh, and who should benefit from that spending. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, and just to add on that really front, um, the language that their stuff, we expect they may still be doing a little bit of fine tuning that language in the reconciliation package, but um, in second, I know there's, a, I know the folks at flag track this pretty closely and as we get details, we would definitely be working on it and also looking to some of our partners to take the lead, who've been doing a lot of really key lead work on the lawsuits and other issues around debt relief. Um, there'll be a lot of information coming out. My guess is as folks get their heads around, as folks get access to the full language details and get their heads around what it might mean. So I would expect more information on that soon. Again, all pending bill passage. Great. So we have just a few minutes left and I want to take a moment now, uh, we promised at the start, we would just, we would point you to some folks in the broader movement space who are resourced and prepared to offer some help or resources or direct technical assistance to growers. And I imagine that many of you on this call are planning to do that yourselves. Uh, and please know like we're grateful for that and appreciative of the hands-on work that you're doing and know that it makes a genuine difference to helping folks get access to support. So thank you for all that you're doing. And if you're in need of some additional referral references, I want to just briefly walk through this list with a heavy caveat. Please know this is not comprehensive. We know there are many more folks offering technical assistance than are reflected here, but I did want to highlight some of the resources and hotlines available from some of our partners in case you are um, working with a grower and in need of some support or a referral resource. Uh, first, I think we have her on call today, but at National Young Farmers Coalition, um, they're able to offer one-on-one -on -one technical assistance for BIPOC farmers who might be interested in applying for aid from CFAP2. And I put Shakira's contact information there, um, and we're appreciative of this work that you all are doing, and just know that this is nationwide, so they're able to help BIPOC growers nationwide on CFAP2 applications. Um, and thank you all for being able to do that. That's amazing. A couple other resource opportunities where you can refer folks. Um, if the question is legal in nature, FLAG has a farmer hotline. I've listed it there. They're great at what they do. Um, our friends at Farm Aid are ready and able to help both with aid questions and for crisis support. Uh, mental health crisis support, um, they are trained and ready to do that. Thank you, Farm Aid friends. I know a few of you are on the call today. Um, and again, they've got a hotline and an email. Um, for folks working with tribal producers, our friends at Intertribal Ag Council are also doing some really excellent hands-on work um, with aid access with tribal producers. So you can definitely reach out to them directly. Um, our friends at Rafi USA work nationally with a Southeast focus and their farmer hotline is also available for producers who could use some assistance navigating COVID aid or disaster relief. Um, so again, you're gonna see their hotline number and the staff time there. So I encourage you to um, make a referral if you'd like. Um, in Ohio, if anybody's on the call from Ohio, INSAC member OFA is able to offer one-on-one -on -one technical assistance for Ohio growers. And also our friends at INCAT, um, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, also have a, the ATRA hotline. And you can see the phone number and email that is staffed and able to support. And again, this is not comprehensive. So if your organization is also offering TA and you wanna name it in the chat, and you're okay taking referrals, we're happy to add it to our resource list and share it with registrants just so that everybody has the fullest picture possible on where they can get aid. Um, and as Wes is saying in the chat, yes, AMS has set up a help desk where folks can call or email with questions about PRS in specific. Um, one question that I don't have answered from AMS, Wes, unless you have gotten an answer from them and their website is not yet clear on this, is whether the help desk is set up for language interpretation um, outside of English speaking um, folks. Do you know if the help desk has been set up for live language interpretation or if they're planning to do so? 
I do not know with certainty, but I do know that uh, in conversations with them, this topic generally came up and they uh, uh, did express that they were working on having resources available uh, 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 beyond just English. I, I do not, I cannot speak though specifically to the help desk, but that is one we can uh, uh, look into as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Wes. Yeah, and that would be a great one to look into because I know that having, having the application, you know, I, I also, my guess is that the DUNS portal is in English only. And so if there's an opportunity there for organizations who specialize in working with growers um, for whom English is not their first or primary language, that may be a key TA opportunity in the weeks to come to support and interpret that process so people can be eligible. Awesome. And then, yeah, we have a question here uh, from Steve. Hi, Steve. What TA providers may offer assistance in Hmong or Mien languages? Um, that's a really good question. And I don't have an answer right now, but I would, if there's anyone on the call who is able to offer that, I'd love to know because we can add that to our resource list. And if that's not the case on the call, we can definitely make some inquiries at INSAC in hopes of, um, in hopes of filling in that support gap if it's needed. And again, if, you're, if that's your organization, you're definitely welcome to say so in the chat or the Q&A box. Awesome, and thank you, Larry, for the heads up on Kentucky. We would be glad to offer uh, to add that to our resource list. And I see Andrew noted uh, New York FarmNet for New York producers. Andrew, if you wanted to share any contact information or additional materials with us, we're happy to add that to our resource list um, and just, again, help strengthen our collective network of where we can go to support and answer questions. Awesome. And thank you, Paul at CAF. That is fantastic to hear uh, for Hmong and Mian language support that you have some colleagues who may be able to provide assistance. That's awesome. And we can follow up about that. Great, and again, um, we know it's not a comprehensive list, but we wanna do all that we can to make sure that as many resources as possible are available to folks. And it takes a really broad network. Um, there's a short turnaround on both of these. Um, just to close us out here, we have about two minutes left. I guess one thing I'll emphasize here is both of these are gonna be pretty quick turnaround endeavors. CFAP is only open for about two more weeks. And PRS will only be open for 45 days. Um, it is not yet the end of the growing season for most people in the US right now. It's the coming on the end of what has probably been a pretty tough and challenging season. So we really do have an opportunity and a need here to do what we can to make sure that folks are aware of the opportunity to get some much needed help for the really hard work that they've been doing over the last year and a half navigating this pandemic. So thank you all for what you're doing and anything that we can do to strengthen one another's network of resources and support, we're happy to do it. Um, and likewise, I'll just also note and name, we are committed to continuing to support you as best we can. So what you'll see from us coming up in the next day or so is again, the six page resource reference that Stephen described earlier um, that walks through at the high level what's open right now. The CFAB2 newly revised this is like your one-stop shop. If you're doing CFAB2 work, you want this guide free from flag. It was shared in the chat. We'll send it out as well. Um, when PRS fully opens, we will be working to get those questions answered and we'll be working to expand the information that we have available to complement what AMS does. Um, I'm gonna flesh out and complete that resource list of where you can refer folks and we'll share that with you. And then finally, this webinar was recorded and we're happy to share it in case you had a colleague who had to miss the session. Uh, finally, and as Eric noted, there's more coming down the line and we're still getting our own heads around what it means, who's eligible and how we can again, try to direct the new resources coming out of USDA uh, in an equitable manner and towards those who have the most need. And so just know that that may look like a comment opportunity a opportunity to educate the agency about where to go, an opportunity to pressure them on that, and more webinars, more opportunities to gather when the resources are made available to understand what they are and how we can get them to the folks in our communities. So just know you may see more webinars and more opportunities from us in the weeks to come. Anything else from the group 
that you all would like to share or say before we wrap up here? And thank you all so much for adding these resources in the chat. I'm gonna add these to the list and this is incredibly helpful and valuable and thank you, um, especially for folks who are able to offer language access. That's gonna be incredibly key these next few weeks. And so thank you for that and we'll add it to our list. Anything else from our flag or INSAC staff you wanna say before we wrap up this afternoon? Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks speakers for walking things through. Thanks questioners for asking great questions. We'll be following up soon with a bunch of materials and we appreciate your time and all the work you're doing. Thanks for being in partnership and we'll be in touch soon.